some preparatory verses. As you know, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Translation. All those verses talk about the simplicity of getting right with God the Father by simply believing in Jesus Christ for it. So let's just pause for a moment of silence and utilize 1 John 1, 9. That gets us back into fellowship with God by naming our sins to Him. So maybe you've, committed, you've already confessed your sins. Just give us, the rest of us, an opportunity to name our sins to God so that we can be back on track under His infilling under his influence, under his empowerment. And that allows God the Holy Spirit to illuminate the truth so that we can see and understand what's about to transpire in the near future as per Revelation chapter 7 and all the way through the rest of the book. So let's pause for a moment of silence and use First John 1 John 1.9 and then I'll open in prayer in just a moment. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for this time where we can assemble together as believers in Christ. We know how vital this is. We're living in a day and age just prior to the rapture of the church. And Father, it's been my objective and goal that as we assemble together as believers in Christ, whether in California, Arizona, or online listening to the recording or joining us through Zoom, my objective is to encourage and exhort people to respond rapidly by taking the spiritual vaccine, which is the gospel message, giving it to those who are dying in their sins, those who are without Christ, without hope, without salvation, not realizing that without Christ they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And so we're grateful, Father, that we have the privilege, because of faith, in, faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, to know that we are on good terms with Thee because of our faith in Jesus Christ. But Father, it is selfish for us to keep it and not share it with others who are in need of this. So help us to be motivated. Help us to focus on Thee. Help us to see that life must be um, approached through the directive as found in Scripture. And so we pray and ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to breeze through chapter 7. And we started or we ended on verse 9 last week. And so, but I'm going to start with 7 because I want us to get the ongoing force of John's letter uh, as found in Revelation because I think we'll be able to get through portions of chapter 8 as well. But I want you to feel the book. I actually want you to feel what John is trying to communicate through this book, this chapter 7 and 8. Because I want you to see what's there. I want you to see the impact of what the words are saying just through this book alone. And so, beginning with verse 1, it says in Revelation 7, After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. So if you could just imagine, I'll read my notes on the bottom in just a moment, but just imagine there are four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow. Here's the goal. That the wind should not blow on the earth. We won't feel the breeze. On the sea, you won't see the ripples on the waters or on any tree. So you won't see the tree or the leaves moving back and forth. So John wants us to have this visual that the winds are not going to be blowing during this time. 
this part here in Revelation 7. Because now it's going to climax and continue to build after this. You got these four angels who are holding back the wind. So that tells me a few things. One, there is no movement at this point. Two, angels are have supreme power, supreme strength to control the wind. So there's not much we can do except put windmills up, right? And harness the power of the wind. In fact, the winds are powerful enough to push the ships and the boats, especially the military aircraft, along the waters uh, around the Pacific, Atlantic waters, and so on. And so we depend on the wind for numerous things, for life. We, if we don't have any air, we don't survive. We die. But these four angels have the kind of power to withhold wind of any sort so that it won't blow on the earth, it won't blow on the sea, or it won't even touch the trees that we see around us. So keep that in the back of your mind so that you know that the power of the angels is supreme. Not as great as God, but enough to say, wow, that's, that's awesome power that's vested in these four angels. They can control the winds so that it won't blow on the earth, sea, or on the tree. I don't know of any other power that can have that kind of sovereignty over the wind. So that's verse 1. But my notes here on the bottom. The four angels in John's vision have the responsibility of restraining the judgment of God pictured by the four winds. So again, just think about the, the power of these four angels. On nature, earth, the sea, and any tree. So you have the verses as found in Jeremiah 49, 36-38, Daniel 7, 2. So if you're the note-taking type, Kind, I would encourage you to write these down and cross-reference this later on. Daniel 7.2, Hosea 13.15, or at least take a picture of it with your phone so that you ha capture everything here. On nature, earth, and the sea, and any tree. So that's Revelation 7.1. Now... Verse 2 says the following. Then I saw another angel. So you have the four and now another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and sea. So listen to, trans listen to the transition here. There's another angel that comes into the scene, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So John sees another angel in addition to the first four. This angel is ascending from the east, literally the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God which is the mark applied to the foreheads of the 144,000. You can see this in um, the next verse, which is uh, chapter 7, verse 3. And so, I, again, we're progressing now through chapter 7. So, four angels, one angel. So, we're seeing these angels that have sovereign power that can control a number of things. Verse 3 says, do, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea or the trees, till what? Till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So this fifth angel, amidst the four, claims to the other four that they are not to do any damage to planet Earth until the 144,000 are what? They're sealed. God wants his servants set apart and ready before any of the judgments fall. Do you see why I started back on verse 1? I wanted to, to, to see the communication of the angel um, uh, among the angels as we move through chapter 7 so that you can see by the time we get to chapter 8. Oh boy. So now verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. 
So John heard the number of those who were sealed as well as the names of the tribes from those of which they came. The fact that 12 tribes are represented reveals that ethnic Israel will retain her unique national entity before God. God's plans for this world revolve around the nation of Israel and from this nation, 12,000 males from each of the 12 tribes will be sealed for the purpose of sharing the testimony of Jesus during the world's darkest hours. You will find more of this when we get to chapter 12, verse 17. So that's Revelation 7, 4. And now we're going to look at the tribes, the name of the tribes. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. That's 7, 5. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. That's 7, 6. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. That's verse 8. After these things, I looked, John, behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. This is where we left off last week. But again, I started from the opening of chapter 7, so that we can get to this point and move forward. So you have these multitudes and 144,000 listed by their respective tribes, the names. Now in verse 10, crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Please make the observation along with me. Notice what it says on 10b, the second half of 10. Salvation belongs to our God. What God? God the Father, not not God the Son, yet. Salvation belongs to God the Father. How do we know that? Who sits on the throne. The one sitting on the throne is God the Father. And to the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So that's the importance of knowing how to observe the text, paying close attention to the text, and having the training so that you won't miss key things that are vital. Because if you blur uh, the Father and the Son, it won't make sense at all. So it belongs to God, the Father, who sits on the throne. It's the Father who's sitting on the throne, not Jesus. The Father is the one sitting on the throne and to Jesus, to the Lamb. So crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, God the Father, and who sits on the throne as well as to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. So the one sitting on the throne at this juncture is the Father, God the Father. So John saw a multitude of people from every nation, tribe, people, and language who were standing before the throne, before God the Father and in front of the Lamb, God the Son. So it's important to make the distinction because when you ask or you're asked, who's sitting on the throne? Depends. Depends on the context. Depends where in the book of Revelation are we looking at. Because if you just, if you hopscotch past seven, and you you go to chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, or 20, and then someone asks you, well, who's sitting on the throne at this point? Well, before the millennium? Well, in Revelation in general. Well, it's, it's the Son. He's the Lamb. He sits on the throne. He judges. Well, you would be wrong. Because it really depends on the context as far as where it's found in the book of Revelation, which is very, this, which is very, very important to make sure you study it closely because we're commanded to study and show ourselves approved. A workman that does not need to be embarrassed or ashamed, correctly, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's not optional. That's a direct command and a directive from God himself. 
So therefore, we must handle the word of God accurately, not loosely, because Satan can do that. He can handle it loosely and make it sound real nice. Oh, if you just ask anything in my name, you'll get it. Well, that's not coming from Jesus. Contextually, there's some other things behind that, such as make sure you're lined up with his will, make sure your thinking is aligned with his thinking. You you don't hear that much because others want, on prosperity teaching want you to be hyper excited because it's sounding really good and it's tiddling your emotions. And if that's not coming from God's word, you may be disappointed when you don't get what they're promising behind the TV screen because they're not handling it accurately. That's why it's extremely important if you're listening to anybody to ensure and make sure because it's your responsibility that they have adequate training, not just opening a book and reading through it. Not everyone can just read it on their own without having some kind of sense of training, just like you would want a doctor who's going to operate on you to have adequate training before they open your back and do some kind of surgery, you will want to make sure that whoever is instructing and teaching the Bible to you or your family, you want to make sure they have been trained, they have been there, they have the experience, the know-how and the walk with God for many of years so that you know that you're getting solid content, not just wishy-washy, something that's tickling the emotions, and so, so on and so forth. So, Salvation belongs to God the Father who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. At this juncture, the Lamb is not even sitting on the throne. It's His Father. Very important to see. Okay, So that's 710. It goes on. Let me see. Verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on the faces before the throne and worshipped God. So at this point, yet another great worship service occurs in heaven and the third service, such third such service in four chapters. So you see that there's this worship, worship, worship taking place in heaven. So, and you see in chapter 7, they stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures uh, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped. So the prostrate, their position here is they're on their faces worshipping the, the sovereign living God. And so you get this sense that it's probably a wonderful experience, probably a real profound ecstatic experience because they're in the throne of grace, standing there before God, now face down because they don't feel worthy to look. So this is a worship position where you're there, you're in, the, in their midst, you got the Father on the throne, and you have the Lamb right next to Him, and you're like, oh my gosh. And so you're, the only thing you could do is get on your knees and face down and just say, wow. I'm here in the presence of God the Father, God the Son. That's a position of worship right there. 7.11, Revelation 7.11. Verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be to our God forever and ever. That's final. That's what Amen means. That's final. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 Verse 12, saying, the opening of 12, notice the sevenfold blessing, which is similar to the sevenfold blessing of the slain lamb of chapter 5, verse 12. There's a similar pattern, this blessing, the sevenfold blessing, unfolding blessing, as we saw in chapter 5, verse 12, and now in chapter 7, verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 7, verse 12. Now, verse 13. One of the, el the elders answered, saying to me, What are these arrayed in, who are these arrayed in white robes? Who are these guys here? dressed in white robes. And where did they come from? This is one of the elders who was up there and asked, 
So one of the elders asked about the identity of the multitude in white robes, only to answer the question himself in the next verse. And I said to him, Sir, you already know. Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Please notice where they came from. These who are clothed in white were the ones who made it through the tribulation. So we're saying, Aha! There are believers there. Yes, aha! But they probably were beheaded. They probably were killed for their faith. Which is why I'm saying, listen closely as we move to Revelation because unless you don't have any care for your friends or family, you're not going to care whether or not they're going through the tribulation. But as you see these truths, I'm hoping that it would motivate you to be, you're not going to be scared anymore, nervous anymore. Because I understand we all have gone through it and we're getting a little nervous. We don't want to... We don't want to ruin our friendship with the person. We don't want to ru ruin our, ten our relationship with our, f our family because they might think because we're a Christian, we're better than them because they're still ABC, that previous re uh, religion that you were a part of. But now that you're a Christian, you don't want to run and, and go smack and, and go clash with them because, well, that's going to create a, a bigger divide between me and them, them and me. And so you say, well, I'd rather just leave it alone so that we can have harmonious relationship when we get together for Easter. Uh, birthdays and holidays such as Christmas, Thanksgiving. So you're saying, well, it's not worth uh, straining the relationship anymore. So I, I'm not going to say anything. But you know what? As I've said in the past, it's worth the strain. It's worth putting the pressure on because their soul is in jeopardy. It's in the balance. So I would rather run the risk of straining the relationship and creating a bigger divide knowing that the seed was planted and the word doesn't come back void. And even though they look at you ridiculous and say, oh, you know what, uh, Val, Don, you, you guys are real strange being this Christian. Well, no, in their eyes you might look like it, but that just, uh, um, that just shows that you love them. That just shows that you care for them. You're concerned about their eternity. You're f concerned about their future, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. I would say do it in grace. You don't want to bash them over the head and say, you know what, you need to believe in this and give this family Bible, this big, humongous family Bible over the head, now, I'm not saying that at all. If you know what you know and you know that eternity is in the balance, all of you, myself included, should extend grace by telling them about how much Jesus loves them. We're living in a day and age where it's cold out there. People don't really care about each other. They cut you off on the street, cut you off on the freeway. Why? Because they want to get there first and they're going to try to show you that their car is faster than yours. And so, you know, there's just too much hypersensitivity. If you go out there for any length of time, you'll notice that people are not the same anymore. There is no respect. There's no uh, fr friendliness anymore among people because there's something going on, ladies and gentlemen. Remember that, okay? There's something going on. And I, that's why I've see it said repeatedly, I think the rapture is just around the corner so we can high five each other and zip, we're up in the, up in the sky, uh, and we're gonna see Jesus. But at the same time, my heart would be very heavy knowing that I still know people who are not yet right with God. And they could live through the tribulation. It's possible they're not gonna say what this is saying in verse 14. They're not going to be washed in the blood of the Lamb because they were killed, because they were hit by a, a meteorite or, or a hailstone that's mixed with blood, which we'll see in just a moment. Because God's trying to wake people up. And rather than have Him talk to everybody that we know, why not we talk to the people that we know? Because if God intervenes via the tribulation, they may not survive the things we're going to see. So, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
So these who went through the uh, tribulation acquiesced to Jesus Christ and so they survive and now, where are they now? They're up there. So that means they died. So on the one hand, it's good that they're there and they were washed in the blood of the Lamb, but the fact that they're there means they're a part of the the group of the martyrs who are in the altar. They were di- they died. So I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to die here on earth beca- being via being beheaded or killed. I don't know how they're going to do it, but it seems to me that there are multiple passages that talk about being beheaded. So this is verse 14. Now. Oh, sorry, this is keep going back. Verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, those who were survive, who survived the tribulation. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So there's this relationship, this close relationship now because they died and they're in the presence of God in this altar. And so we're told that the celebration is unending and they're before the throne of God and serve him day and night. You notice what it says there in verse 15. They're before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. Now I know what you're saying. I don't want to serve God day and night. I, I, I'd rather, you know, go out and have some fun and, you know, relax, go to the beach, go to wherever, Philippines, Hawaii. But remember... We're going to be now in the eternal state. We're now going to be either in heaven or not yet. We're still going to, in the future, see after the great white throne judgment, eternal separation for those who reject God. So here there's a day and night um, serving of God. And so we're thinking on from our human viewpoint that ah, it's going to be boring. Well, not really. I have a feeling that we're going to be excited to do this. And the Bible doesn't really go into great detail. But I tell you what, from everything we've seen thus far, falling prostrate, and heads down, worshiping God, it seems to me we're going to enjoy it. So while we may not think it's a fun thing to do, our, our whole disposition, our whole person is going to be radically different. We're going to have a body similar to that of Christ. So those things that we might not enjoy on this side of eternity, we most likely will on the other side of eternity. So day and night they serve him in his temple. So the celebration is unending and that they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night. Their hunger and thirst will be satisfied forever and forever they will be sheltered from harm. Each of these benefits is dispensed personally by the Lamb. He is at the center of the throne and will, and will shepherd them, guide them to the springs of waters of life, and wipe away every tear from their eye. We're going to see that in verse 17. Verse 16. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. You can see... Um, We'll see in just next slide, um, my note here, let me read this first. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight, sun light on them, nor any heat shall the sun strike upon them. This passage is found in Isaiah 49.10, as well as the punishment of the fourth vial, which is part of the 21 judgments that those during the tribu- tribulation period will undergo. So now I'm going to highlight chapter 16, verse 8, the part of the vile judgment, so that you can see, and maybe it'll help us understand, the sun shall not strike them anymore. Look at what it says here. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. Power was given to him to scorch men with fire. Scorch is an intense heat. Scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. So the scorching, the heat, the intense heat where you will even blaspheme the name of God is such that it shows me that this is not going to be a fun time. So when it talks about the sun will not hit them, 
That's a positive thing. So contextually, we have to see the sense of where the author is going with the book. You don't want to just say, well, it just means there's no more sun. Maybe it's like an umbrella for us Filipinos. We just cover ourselves from the sun using an umbrella. No, this is going to be ramped up a thousand, uh, thousand times above the sun's normal power. Men were scorched with great heat. They blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they still did not repent or give him glory. That's the hardness of man's heart, which is why start now, plant the seed now, because we're seeing during the tribulation period, people won't bother. They don't care. We saw in previous studies, they'll go to the rocks and the stones and the caves, hide us from the Lord. So they don't want to give in. They would rather go psychotic and talk to the rocks, the caves, and say, hide us from the Lamb. And so there's a sense that people will continue to have a calloused heart. And God is going to ultimately win. He's always going to get his way. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Either you do it on your own volition or he's going to make you. And that's the sense that we see in Revelation. He will make you. When I say you, I'm talking about the unbeliever. So he will get every, he will force them down and you will worship me. You will confess. So, on the one hand, he's gracious now. On the other hand, people will meet him as judge. So either you're going to meet him as Heavenly Father who is gracious because you acquiesce to Jesus Christ or he will coerce you. He will force you to bow the knee and confess him as Lord. So you either go gracefully by responding to him or he's going to force you to bow the knee to him. So that's why it, it concerns me knowing what I know that people are so, you know, distracted with the details of life. They're having fun with doing all sorts of things without considering that we're running out of time. And instead of focusing on self and having fun, and I'm not opposed to fun. I like to relax and have fun too, but time is of the essence. Before you know it, how many times have you said, oh, I was supposed to do that last week? Because sometimes time goes by really quickly and we get so distracted with this, 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 and this that what we said we will do tomorrow never happens. And so as pastor, I'm saying, look, we got to do it now because we're going to, it's just going to slip through our fingers and then we're going to say, oh my gosh, I was really planning to, but I forgot. Now he's dead. Oh. <sighs> then you're going to kick yourself in the butt a hundred times, say, I can't undo that. So I would encourage you all online in California, in Arizona, Philippines, do it now because you're going to get to the point where you're going to say, well, I was really planning to, but they're gone. It's too late. Too late. That's verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out the bowl on the sun and so it's given him to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. So who had power over the plagues? Who was controlling the plagues? God. Verse 17, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So for the Lamb, for the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Notice that the slain but risen Redeemer is the focal point of God's redemptive activity. The good shepherd of John 10.11 is now the shepherd of all the sheep. We see some of this in 10.16 where he talks about my sheep and those who are not of this fold, those who are future uh, after his own disciples. So verse 8, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. We're now in chapter 8, ladies and gentlemen. We're now transitioning to the next level. The next tier. So when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. This is the silence before, the, what's it called? There's a saying. Um, but this is the silence before the storm, something along those lines. But the idea here is that there was silence in heaven. Think about that. It got really quiet. Amidst all the 
things that we heard, the angel telling the four angels to be quiet and then don't, har don't harm the land yet. And then even the worshiping going on day and night, night and day. Now it's quiet. By the time we get to chapter 8, verse 1, there was silence in heaven when he opened the seventh seal. There, so everybody was quiet like, oh my gosh, this is it. So the opening of the seventh seal is a most important event confirmed by the fact that there was silence in heaven for about half an hour after it was open. After it was open, there was quiet. It didn't take place before. It took place after it was open. So that's important. That's important. an important detail to see because remember, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So technically chronologically the seal was open and then silence uh, occurred so the contents of the seven trumpets indicate that they differ from the seven seals verse 2 I saw the seven angels who stand before God now we see a visual here seven angels before God and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, so we're going from seals to trumpets. As John observed the heavenly scene, he wrote that he saw the seven angels to whom were given seven trumpets. The fact that these are angels, trumpets distinguishes them from the trumpet of God. It's not the same as the trumpet of God as seen in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 or 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Completely different. And from the other New Testament trumpets. So this is a, a trumpet that was, that's being opened here in chapter 8. Seven angels, seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So we're seeing now what's going on in the throne room of God. We have this picture that John was privy to so that we have a recording as we are reading it together. So now the notes here is that, let me just do something here. In the meantime, another angel offers to the Lord a large amount of incense and the prayers of all the saints. You see that in verse 3. Um, these prayers are the petitions of martyrs from the tribulation who cried out previously for divine vengeance and justice and were told to wait. Remember that? Chapter 6, 10 through 11. The fact that they rise with sweet-smelling incense suggests it is a pleasant experience to, for God to receive the prayers of His people, which is why we should be a praying group. We should be a church, a body of believers online, in person. We should take seriously our prayers. And so when Lead Deacon Don asks for prayers or he shares the prayers, that is pleasant before God, before the throne of grace. And so he takes these and there is a sense of um, pleasantness about the prayers that come from the church or the believers. And so we get this when we're looking closely at the verses in front of us. So he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. So that's verse 3. We're One second here. Oh. Okay. There you go. Sorry about the doodling there. I don't think I could take it off now. But the smoke of the incense, verse 4, with the prayers of the saints ascended before God and from the angel's hand. So that's Revelation 8, 4. Now, the notes. Throughout the book of Leviticus, incense arose to God's presence and therefore incense, incense came to represent the prayers of God's people. 
The martyrs' prayers were not in vain despite God's delayed response. Because now, as they go up in the presence of God from the angel's hand, they prompt an immediate response. And we'll see this in just the next verse. Of angelic fire being hurled to the earth. This brings about accompanying peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and even an earthquake. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just see if I can erase this. I don't know. Oh, yeah, I think I can. One second. I don't want it to be a distraction. All right, there you go. Okay, so now, look at verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises. So after the chucking of this censer from the altar and to the earth, notice what happened. Here's the, con here's the consequences to the angel throwing it. There were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. This is when the angel chucked the censer towards the earth. Threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Let's move on. Well, let me read the notes here, so you have a sense here. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire of the altar. So, you have this visual? I'm trying to be as specific as and literal as we see it here on the text. Sometimes we don't have the additional details, and so I'll add my, my sense there. So, the angel took the censer, then he filled it with fire of the altar. I'm using the words as, as we see it in verse 5. Where he takes fire, which he cast upon the earth. So he hurls it to the earth. So this action denotes that God's judgments are about to descend on the earth. And it therefore forms a visible token of God's acceptance of the prayers of the saints, as we've seen earlier, and his answer to them. So he heard the, he got the prayers coupled with the incense, and now he's responding to the prayers. This is basically what's going on here. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire with, from the altar, and the next thing we read is that he threw it to the earth. Remember the strength of the angels, the four angels? He's holding back the, the winds so it wouldn't blow in the sea, wouldn't blow on the earth, wouldn't blow on the trees. So imagine this angel hurling this censer that is filled with fire from the altar of heaven itself. He threw it to the earth and here's what happened. Noises, thunderings, lightnings, and then an earthquake from one angel. But watch. Watch what happens. So the seven angel who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So please visualize this in your mind. There are seven angels standing and they have the same power, I'm sure, as the four who held back the winds. Okay. So now there's seven of them. There's three additional angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So there's going to be this blast of the trumpets. So now, within the seventh seal are seven trumpets, which depict a whole new round of judgments. And the seven angels prepare to administer them. The first angel sounded, we're looking at Revelation 8-7. The first angel sounded and hail Ladies and gentlemen, please notice. The first angel blew the trumpet and then hail and fire followed. Do we have a description of what it looks like? Yes. It was mingled with blood. What was mingled with blood? Hail. I understand you guys experienced hail in California recently. Or maybe it's still ongoing, depending on where you are in California. I think Mission Vale, Rancho, Santa Margarita, you're experiencing hailstone. I want you to envision this. The first angel blew the trumpet, sounded, and hail and fire followed. Imagine the hail that's coming down in your place of residence at the moment. Very light, 
just bouncing off the grass, bouncing off the concrete, the sidewalk, maybe hitting the car, and you can hear um, uh, the noise of ice. But this one is rather different. After a, a trumpet sound from the angel who had power to hold back the winds, he blew the first trumpet and hail and fire followed the trumpet sound. It was mingled with blood. What was mingled with blood? The hailstone. And they were thrown to the earth. What was thrown to the earth? The hailstone. It was mingled with fire and blood. It says hail and fire followed. Well, actually, let me correct myself. Hail and fire followed after the angel sounded. It was mingled with blood and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees, here's the impact, ladies and gentlemen, a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass burned up. You like green? Do you have greenery in your yard, in your backyard? Gone. All burned up. And it was impacted by the hail and fire mingled with blood. So it's hail, hailstones coming down with fire mingled with blood. I want you to picture that, okay? This is forthcoming. This is around the corner, ladies and gentlemen. This is what's going to happen when those will not acquiesce to Jesus Christ. And so you have what it takes to bar them and prevent them from experiencing this. This is the first angel. He sounded off. Hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. The hail and the fire mingled with blood came down to the earth after the first trumpet. And the impact was that a third of the trees were burned up. All the green grass, every grass, all grass around the world that is considered green was burned up. That's verse 7. We'll go a few more slides and then we'll continue this next week. As the first angel sounded his trumpet, hail and fire mixed with blood was hurled down upon the earth, resulting in a third of the earth being burned up, including the trees, all green grass. This devastating judgment like that announced by, the most, like by most of the trumpets primarily affected a third of the earth. Is a third of the earth a lot? Calculate it. Think about it on your own. Use your phone. Use your um, calculator. And I think you'd be surprised that a lot of damage is going to take place on earth just by the first blowing of the trumpet. By the one angel who has the power to hold the winds back. Because he threw the hail and fire mingled with blood and hurled it to the earth, a third of the trees were burned up. All the green grass was burned up. All because of the angel who blew his trumpet. Verse 8. Then the second angel, angel number 2, sounded and something, something like a great mountain burning with what? Fire. Fire depicts judgment. Anger of God. Burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea <coughs> became blood. Do you see what I see? Verse 8. Let me repeat. The second angel, again, has the, having the ability to hold back wind, power in other words, he blew the trumpet and says the second angel sounded, that's referring to the trumpet, something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Do you like to go into the ocean? Do you like to sunbathe? Do you like to go surfing? Deacon Don? And so now the waters are contaminated. How do we know that? Well, something like a great mountain was falling and fell and smacked into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. Imagine what that is. How that looks like. How that smells. Well, we know it became, it actually it became blood. It wasn't like a mountain. It wasn't like blood. Notice, something like a great mountain. So these are words that John is trying to communicate and convey, convey to us as the re readers and the recipient of this letter. So something like a great mountain, kind of like the word tastes like chicken. He's trying to describe something the best that he can. Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. 
So he sees this. And a third of the sea became blood. So that then doesn't have the word like blood. Became blood, ladies and gentlemen. Became blood. Why did it become blood? Because something like a mountain that was burning with fire hit the sea. And a third of the sea around the world became blood. Not like blood. Became blood. Imagine what happened to all the fish and all those that are in the bottom of the ocean. They would have to have died because they can't live with blood. They're used to salt water. They're used to water. They're used to even the even those that are powerful animals of the deep, the whales, the orcas, the dolphins, all these large animals, they're going to die. And think about what it's going to do around the surrounding area, the coastal areas. If you've late, Lately we've seen things wash up on the sea, on the beach, right? Imagine what else is going to wash up. Everything else is going to wash up because something like a mountain was burning with fire, hit the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. When is this happening, ladies and gentlemen? It is taking place during the tribulation. Are you not worried about your loved ones, your friends, who will undergo this? To me, I don't want them to. Which is why, wherever God wants me to talk to people about the Lord, I'm on it. Because I know, knowing what the Word says... I realize that God has given, He's allowed me to be privy to these truths and I'm responsible for the things that I'm learning. The things I've learned and the things that I'm teaching, I have to make sure it's accurate to the text of Scripture. I don't want to mishandle the Word and say something God never said. Having said that, as we close now, you too are responsible for the information that you're taking in with me. So now that you see what you see, you're responsible for the people that you know, the people that you love, the people that in your periphery, because you now know what is forthcoming. And this is just, this is where we're moving into greater detail as far as what's going to take place as we move through the tribulation. And eventually it'll be called the Great Tribulation. We haven't seen anything yet, ladies and gentlemen. So this is where we will stop. I know we're going to partake in communion. And so I, I, rather than go through the rest of the slides here, I'm going to reserve this for next week. Those online, I would cur encourage you to come back. And those on, on meeting face-to-face -face in California, just continue to rally together and brace yourself for the things that are forthcoming for the rest of the book of Revelation as we will see together. But now, let's go to God in prayer with our heads bowed and then I'll... Close in prayer and then let's give him the honor and glory that rightfully belongs to him. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to examine your word. We see what is forthcoming and we truly are responsible for telling the people that we know, the people that we love, and no longer dabbling around with, oh, I'm too shy, I don't want them to know. We're responsible for the things that we've looked at today. And so, Father, there's no two ways about it. We have to go full bore and share the gospel with people so that they can come to faith, recognizing that uh, though they may not want to at first, as they learn what your word says, they will um, be grateful for the things that they will sidestep and not have to undergo as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. I encourage everybody to um, take in more doctrine, more of your word, because that's how we grow and that's how we bring you honor and glory. So as we continue with this series, I pray that we would be motivated and challenged and exhorted to be proactive in sharing the gospel so that we would not have to see people left behind. And I'm not talking about like the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. But just the same, it, it is a matter of fact that they will be left behind. So help us now, Father, to take seriously our faith and to be proactive in what we believe in. No longer uh, taking this lightly and saying, as long as I'm saved, I'm happy. But Father, we know that you have tasked us to be ambassadors. And I pray, Lord, that those online and even those 
who are listening to the recording on our YouTube channel, that they too would be challenged to take seriously their faith. And so we thank you, Father, for this time. And now, Father, we're going to take a moment of silence and then we're going to proceed with our communion. And we ask and pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. And so now I'll ask the uh, men and those who are involved with dispersing the communion uh, elements to uh, go ahead and pass the elements so that we can partake together. And if you're online, if you have um, any bread or crackers and wine or juice, dark juice, I would encourage you to partake with us as we recall uh, what transpired 2,000 years ago. Okay, so I would like to share something from the book of Corinthians and then make a few comments now that uh, the elements are dispersed. In the Corinthian church, Paul wrote to the church. He said the following as he was recalling uh, what had transpired with the Lord Jesus Christ. For I received from the Lord that which I had also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And one of the things that I'm fond of saying is that Jesus still was meeting with his disciples in spite of the fact that he knew that the, pro the greatest problem of all was looming before him. He did not stop or prevent himself with going and meeting and staying true to his commitment with his disciples. And so the idea here is that he was now going to teach another key doctrine that was going to be etched in the lives of his disciples forevermore so that they can go and pass the baton to future disciples. He goes on by saying, The Lord on the same night in which he was betrayed, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake in by taking the bread or the wafer and let me give thanks. Father, we are most grateful for what was accomplished 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. We know, Lord, that, that if he, Jesus Christ did not go on the cross, we would still be in our sins. And Father, there would be no hope for us. We would be just like the unbeliever. But Father, the fact that you uh, allowed your son to go on the cross to pay the sin debt of the world, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we have, no, we have no reason to worry anymore because we are children of God, those who are heaven bound, those who are sons and daughters of the Most High. And because of that, partaking in the Eucharist or the communion allows us to recall what your son had done 2,000 years ago. And so that brings us great joy and we could rejoice and be thankful that even though our problems are real, even though there's a lot of challenges in life, they're temporal at best. These are things that are short-lived compared to eternity. So we thank you, Father, for this opportunity for us to partake in the bread, which is your body symbolically, which has been broken for us. And we ask and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's partake. goes on to say, <clears throat> in the same manner, <coughs> he also took <coughs> the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake. Heavenly Father, truly it is a privilege to be able to gather together with the saints who come together each and every week, online and in person. We do this because we love you. <clears throat> we have... <coughs> multiple challenges, we have difficulties in life, there's an array of things that, were, that are bothering us, challenging us, but Lord, we know that we can count it all joy, not that it is a 
joyful or pleasant experience. <clears throat> but we know that your grace is sufficient. We can count on you. It was you who said to Paul that my power is perfected in weakness. And so, Father, if any of us are experiencing weaknesses of any kind, spiritual, physical, we exchange those for your strength. We exchange those for grace. For we know that this is something that you had uttered to us and left in your word in Second Corinthians. And so, Father, by faith, we believe it. The reality of challenges, the reality of problems, are things that we are, we're already aware of based on your truth, based on the word of God. Those who follow you will be hated. They hate you, they will hate us. And so, Father, the Bible is replete with all sorts of realities that remind us if we stand for you, then the adversary is going to be really, really upset. He's going to do everything in his power to slow us down. But it says, the church will not, the church will not um, stop. The gates of hell will not prevail. And so the sense there, the idea is that the church will continue to push forward in spite of the challenges of Satan himself. And so, Father, regardless of the things that we go through, and they are tough at times, we understand that. We know that we have you in our corner. We have you who love us, and we're told that greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. If God be for us, who can be against us? And, Father, we have all these principles and promises that encourages us, even though we may at times feel down all by ourselves and wanting to give up because we're tired. And Father, we know that you understand that. But at the same time, I know for a fact as well that your Bible, your word, gives us hope, gives us a chance to recognize that you continue to be sovereign, you continue be, to be in control. And so we rejoice in knowing that in the promise of Romans 8.28, for us who love you, you cause all things to work together for good for those who love you. So thank you, Father, for reminding us that. Sometimes we just need to be reminded during this time where we're partaking in the communion table. And so we ask and pray all of these things in Christ's beautiful name in which we pray. Amen. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this time. And so we will now conclude our service and we'll resume again next week uh, with um, continuing with Revelation chapter 8. We'll trek through it and we'll continue to move until we're finished with the book. So we thank you for joining us with this uh, ministry of ours. And so I encourage you to come back, but I also encourage you to join me during the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday is our our course on basic, it's called the Basic Training Field Manual by Gene Cunningham. And Wednesday I'm also teaching at church here at NCBC. And Thursday we're talking about uh, what is the spiritual life about by uh, an author by the name of Moses Onwebiko. So all of that can be con uh you can be a part of that through this same link, except for Wednesday night, where my church here has a different link. And so if you're interested, I would encourage you to go to our church website. The church website is churchofhopeontheweb.org. Again, churchofhopeontheweb.org. Go to teaching, and you'll have a list of all the links available to the various studies. The link for Tuesday and the link for Thursday are the one and the same. So if you're using this link online, that link is what we use for Tuesday and Thursday nights, 7 p.m. Um, California time. And so Wednesday night is 4.30 California time. And so if you're interested, join me on Wednesday nights. We're also going through basic field training, uh, basic training field manual. We're on a different chapter here. But I would love to see you all because that and, and when we're gathered together like this, I do believe that God is honored and glorified. That's our um, contribution as a form of worship when we prioritize and put him first. So I know some of you have uh, very difficult schedules and I understand that. But 
for those who do not and you're available, I would strongly encourage you to be a part of it because that's where our lives are transformed. That's where the renovating of the mind takes place and we're transformed to the likeness of Christ. But before I go into another ser uh, sermon, I'll just close there and encourage you to join Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So thank you for your time and may the Lord bless you all. God bless you. Take care. Thank you, Pastor Freddie. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that lasts the Saturday in the first.